You didn't work up. Good. The meeting's being recorded. Excellent. Um, oh, and Angus has just clapped for me. We, thank you, Angus. Uh, you're very, you're very kind. Uh, <laughs> um, pleasure to to be here virtually. Uh, it's a pleasure because I haven't had to travel, so uh, it's it's you know no no, no big issue. I'm, I'm giving this lecture from my study at home. Uh, yes. So what what I I do I want to talk about my my, my new book. Uh, so let me share screen and show some of my PowerPoint slides. There we go. So, yeah, I mean, th this book came out in March and uh, I, you know, before it came out, I had to have the book tour all planned. I was, I was going to do a book tour of the US because it's published by Princeton University Press, which are American uh, uh, publishers. So I had a, a, a tour of the US going from East Coast to West Coast, all very exciting. And then of course it all just crumbled and disappeared. So I've, I've given this talk a few times, uh, several times um, as, um, you know, virtual talks at literary festivals and science festivals. Uh, but still, you know, we can, I can say what I need to say and I can show you pictures and talk about some of the, the aspects of the book. Um, the world of the physics, as a, a colleague of mine uh, at Surrey, in fact, he's head of the physics department, Justin Reed. Um, he's a, he's a, an expert on dark matter. And so when I, I talk about dark matter in the book, I, I asked him for, for, to check it over and, you know, cause it's not my, my specialism. Uh, so anyway, he helped me. And uh, when the book came out, I gave him a copy. And, and, he, and he pointed out this rather interesting uh, uh, fact about the, the front cover that if you put your thumb on the books, it just reads the world according to Jim Al-Khalili, which, which is sort of, I mean, I, I, I am a bit polemical in the book. I sort of bang on about certain things that I feel very strong about, but I'm not advocating or promoting any particular theory. So there are other, there, there, there are other books that have come out in, uh, in the last year or, or, or two, I don't know if you, you've read any of the work of Sean Carroll, the um, uh, Caltech cosmologist, American cosmologist, um, who's written a book called Something Deeply Hidden, which is all about a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics, the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics and how I'm sure you, you, will, you will all, I'm not sure how many first years there are in the audience, but you know, if you haven't hit quantum mechanics uh, with a vengeance just yet, simply to say that you know, when, when you make a measurement in quantum mechanics, you collapse what's called the wave function and very, one of, of many options is, is realized that you, you know, that you, 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 the measurement that you make. World's interpretation, the universe splits into many uh, um, different realities and, you know, cats are dead in, in one universe and alive in another when you open the box, that, that business. Um, so so well, my point is that Sean's book is very much um, uh, promoting, defending a, 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 a stance or a theory that he's plugging. Whereas this book is really not, I, I don't have any sort of uh, particular pet theory that I'm trying to promote. What is it about? So it's, it's let me just get you a, say, get you a copy. I mean, show you a copy. The book is actually very, very small. See? It's, it's, it's tiny, it's pocket sized. Um, it's, it's not one of those books that's, you know, you know weighs a ton uh, doorstop. I mean, people might buy it and use it as a doorstop, I don't know. But, it, you know, it's not like the thousand page tomes that people write, which cover all areas of physics and, you know, deriving from scratch, starting from the ancient Greeks uh, and so on. Um, it, it, the way I describe it is, is, is like this. If all knowledge of the physical universe, physics, being, you know, um, chemistry, biology, let's say, and so the, the, the natural world. If all our knowledge of the physical universe is an island, then of course that island is finite in size, the amount of knowledge we have. Beyond its shores uh, is the, the great ocean of the unknown, um, the stuff that we have yet to discover. There's still, there, there are still things out there that we don't know, right? And we don't know if that ocean goes on forever or we will one day know everything. Um, a lot of books on popular science are, are basically an exploration of the island. Um, this book is a, a sort of an exploration of the shoreline. 
So it's the, the very limits of what we know. Here we are in 2020, what do we know about the universe? You know, the, the, at, at the limits of our knowledge. And what I also do in the book is, you know, take the reader out paddling into the water a bit. So, so let's explore the sort of things that we don't quite understand. We know they're there. Uh, these are known unknowns, not the unknown unknowns. The known, so we know they're, you know, dark matter, dark energy, that sort of thing, you know, whether the Big Bang had something before it and so on. Uh, and, and see how they may or may not fit into our current understanding uh, of, of the physical universe. Um, but it's also my love with, with physics. I, I, in fact, the very first sentence I think in the book is, this, is, this book is my ode to physics. I fell in love with the subject when I was what, 13, 14, when I realized that this was the subject I had to study if I wanted to find answers to some of my questions. You know, like, you know, does the universe go on forever? Uh, what does the inside of an atom look like? What happens if I fall into a black hole? You know, the usual stuff, which I hope most of you have chosen to study physics for, for you know, that same reason, that, that curiosity about, about, about the universe around us. Um, and, you know, I've been sort of in love with that subject all my life and, and I'm still searching for an some, an some questions I've had answered because I've studied them and I know what we know now about the universe. Some questions I'm still looking for, for answers to. And, I, and that's the flavour of, of, of this book. Um, now, I talk about the, the ocean of the unknown, the fact that there's still stuff out there that we haven't yet figured out. Well, going back to... So this is an article by Stephen Hawking published in... There we go, 1981. Um, where uh, he he argues. So if I if I just highlight that um, the first uh, paragraph, basically asking whether the end is in sight for theoretical physics. So in this article, I want to discuss the possibility that the goal of theoretical physics might be achieved in the not too distant future, say by the end of the century, the end of the twentieth century, not not the twenty. By this I mean that we might have a complete, consistent and unified theory of the physical interactions which would describe all possible observations. What he's talking about is basically a theory of everything. Okay, so a theory that unifies all physical phenomena in the universe. Uh, it unifies the four forces of nature, it unifies our uh, theories, you know, you, you will hear a lot about, you know, searching for a theory of everything. Um, a theory of quantum gravity, which unifies quantum mechanics with Einstein's general relativity. Um, in, in 1981, Stephen Hawking writes this article, it really was thought to be, you know, we were, that we were getting close. And by, you know, sort of 10, 15 years after that, it was still thought that we were getting even closer, that we were on the brink of a theory of everything, string theory, theory you know these were ideas that it was thought really were going to unify uh, uh, our current understanding of all the laws and and, uh, uh, and uh, forces of nature a hundred years earlier at the end of the 19th century physicists also had a similar confidence that they were coming to the end of physics by 1880 I think Physicists felt that, you know, well, we've got Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, we've got thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, of course, we've got Newton's mechanics and his law of gravity. That's everything, right? So, you know, we, we, we're, we're pretty much there or thereabouts. There's nothing else to learn. And then in the 1890s, what happens? We discover the, the first elementary particle. Uh, we discover x-rays and radioactivity and what, what, you know, what the hell is that? You know, why is it called x-rays? Because x is the unknown. People didn't know what it was until we discovered that it was high energy electromagnetic radiation. Um, and that then heralded a revolution in physics. By 1900, you got Max Planck coming along explaining black body radiation, saying that uh, the heat that's given off by warm bodies is, is quantized. It comes in lumps, which we now call photons. Um, uh, Einstein comes up with uh, relativity theory and so on. And, you know, and, and the rest is history. So we weren't near the end of physics at the end of 19th century at all. We have the whole of what we still amusingly call modern physics, even though it's over 100 years old now. 
And the same sort of sentiment, I think, applies now. Um, that Stephen Hawking was wrong when he said we were coming to the end of physics. Now, that's not necessarily because we have undergone a revolution in the same way that we did at the 19th century or of the 20th century. But certainly we've discovered there are gaps in understanding. There are bigger holes than probably people, Stephen Hawking and others thought back then 40 odd, odd years ago. If I look back to what has been discovered during my career as a physicist, well, let's just look at the last decade. Here's, here's two examples, the, the uh, discovery of the Higgs boson. There's uh, the famous Peter Higgs, front of a black. Um, so that was you know, discovered at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, this particle that is meant to complete the standard model of particle physics. Uh, we sort of, you know, it, it was a missing piece in the jigsaw. And then four years later, the, uh, the LIGO facilities in America um, uh, discovered uh, gravitational waves. Uh, so obviously you can, I'm, I'm sure you know that uh, the gravitational waves from the collision and merger of two black holes, this picture here is not drawn to scale. They're not sitting at the round about the orbit of the moon <laughs> close to, the, to Earth. In fact, the, the first gravitational waves that were detected in 2016 came from an event over a billion light years away. So those waves had been rippling through space itself at the speed of light for over a billion years. And, uh, you know, the, the, the simplest analogy is, you know, you drop a stone in a pond and the ripples will propagate radially outwards. Now, if it's a very big pond, it doesn't matter how big the stone is that you drop in the middle. Those waves will, as they spread out, of course, they lose energy. Uh, because they're having to cover a wider, wider surface area of the pond. So by the time the reach the shoreline of a large pond, they're very small, they're very tiny, they're very weak. Um, and uh, that's what we detected on Earth in, in 2016. The tiniest of um, wobbles of stretching and squeezing in space itself as these waves of space passed through us. Now this was predicted by Einstein theory and, and it's been a while that we've been looking for these gravitational waves. We just needed to build an instrument that was delicate and sensitive enough. And just the feat of physics and engineering that went into building these um, LIGO facilities. You're basically bouncing laser beams off mirrors many times at right angles to each other and, and, uh, and they interfere with each other uh, destructively because the path lengths that traveling at right angles to each other aren't exactly the same. So laser interferometry on a very massive uh, scale. Nevertheless, they're only out of phase by, by you know, time, you know, a length much smaller than an atom because these uh, uh, the space is being stretched and squeezed by such a tiny amount, given how far away the original event was. My point is that you might think these are wonderful discoveries in physics, but they didn't cause a revolution because they weren't unexpected. You know, we've been looking for the Higgs boson. It was predicted by Peter Higgs half a century ago. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it had been more surprising had we not found it. The gravitational waves, a whole century. Einstein's general theory of relativity in 1915 predicted the existence of gravitational waves. So for many, many decades, we've been searching for them and sure enough, we found them tick that box. So these are not revolutions in physics. They're exciting discoveries. They, they, they make headlines. You know, they, they, what's nice about science uh, these days is that the news media do science stories you know it is but it's not it's not just an aside that these boffins you know and finally boffins in some university have discovered something that no one cares about you know, now it's all like you know large hadron collider and black hole black holes um extrasolar planets that sort of stuff makes the news so it's exciting but it didn't cause a revolution in physics the one unexpected discovery 
in physics. The, you know, the really uh, uh, surprising discovery that w w has is having to alter our understanding of the universe took place in 1998 uh, and its discovery of dark energy. So this is my uh, how I depict dark energy causing the heat death of the universe, a mysterious repulsive force borrowed from some famous Hollywood movie. Um, um, when I've been running, uh, I don't, haven't done it for a couple of years, but I've run first small group tutorials for the first years. And one of the questions uh, I ask them in, in astronomy is, you know, what is the, um, uh, the most important discovery in astronomy in your lifetime? And I forgot that, you know, if when I do this year on year, 1998 starts to get to be a bit beyond the lifetime of my first year undergraduate. So I said, oh, you know, you didn't mention dark energy. You know, when was that? 1998. Well, I wasn't born then. <laughs> so it's, you yeah, know, it might not seem a long time ago to me, but yeah, it's a lifetime ago for, for undergraduate students. But this was surprising. It was unexpected. No one anticipated dark energy. Essentially, uh, astronomers were looking at um, uh, the research speed of distant galaxies. We've known the universe is expanding since the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble's work. And by the universe expanding, that doesn't mean that galaxies are moving through space away from each other. It's that the space in between them is stretching. They are sitting still in their region of the universe, but the gap, the space between them is stretching. So the further out you look into space, faster galaxies look like they are moving away from us in every direction. And we've known this. What was surprising was the discovery that very distant galaxies are, are moving at, uh, not moving at the right speed that they should be. Now, here's the subtlety, and it's one of those things where, you know, in cosmology, you, you've got to, hang on a minute, let me get this around in my head, uh, right in my head. Those distant galaxies were seen to be moving more slowly than they should be given their distance. Now, you might think on the face of it, that means the universe expansion is slowing down. But think about it carefully. The, the further away you're looking, the further back in time you're, you're looking at the universe. So those ga galaxies that were being measured, what you were seeing was the light that has arrived on Earth from those galaxies that has been traveling for billions of years. So what you're actually seeing was the recession speed of galaxies many billions of years ago. And it was slower then than the expansion of the universe is, you know, when, when we look at slightly closer galaxy uh, to us and, and, and their recessions. So the story is from the dark energy is that the universe starts in a big bang, expanded, and we, everyone thought, all the textbooks thought that it'll, it'll uh, carry on expanding, but it will slow down because of the gravity's putting the brakes on the expansion whether it would slow down enough to stop to recollapse in on itself or whether it would just slow down and then drift no one knew that depends on various cosmological parameters the density of matter and energy no one thought was it would expand slow down and then at some halfway through its lifetime that you know so far so like roughly about seven billion years after the big bang it started speeding up again what we now think is there's something out there that has started winning the, the, the fight against gravity. As galaxies move further and further away from each other, their mutual gravitational attraction uh, gets weaker. But this mysterious repulsive force, which we've called dark energy for no good reason, is causing the universe to, to, to stretch out ever more quickly. So the universe isn't like a rubber band that you're pulling it and, or spring, it gets harder and harder to pull and recollapses. It's more like blue tack. You know, it's harder to pull, but as you stretch it more and more, oh, it starts easier to expand, to, to, to stretch away. So dark energy is one of those things that we have yet to understand. It's one of the things that you you would have to paddle out from my island of knowledge to encounter. We know it's there. We're starting to get an inkling for what it might be, what its origin might be, what we call the, you know, the vacuum and quantum vacuum energy. But, you know, the fact that we're not sure suggests that, you know, we, we may be, we, there still may be some surprises ahead. Um, in terms of 
getting to the end of physics then, it was thought, and, and to some extent, a lot of physicists still still think that. And I'm, I'm, there, there will be um, lecturers uh, in, in your department who you may not know because they teach your undergraduate courses. You might not know much about what their research program is, but they might be working on theories of quantum gravity. Um, I want to do is, first of all, say something about how far we've come in trying to get to a theory of everything. It's part of a program which physicists have been working on for centuries, and it's called unification. The idea of finding two different phenomena or mechanisms or forces, right? Um, some two different properties of the universe that we thought had nothing to do with each other, only to discover they were connected. They were part of the same underlying principle or the same underlying equation or the same underlying force. Uh, and so I'm very, I have to say I'm very um, pleased with this slide because I've gone to town with PowerPoint uh, and animation, animation, not animation in a, in a cool lots of things, lots of pretty pictures and things. No, animation just in terms of revealing words uh, uh, slowly. So I'm going to fill it up. I do, I do like this slide. So let's start. The first step in unification was probably the work of Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, uh, whether or not it, whether it's apocryphal or true, he, you know, he tells this to sitting under uh, an apple tree in his, on his mother's farm. And he notices that the falling apple pulled down to earth by gravity, uh, he comes to the realization that that is the same force as the one that holds the moon in orbit around the earth and the earth in orbit around the sun and so on. And he develops Newtonian gravity. So Newtonian gravity is, is, is a very important first step in unification because until Newton came along, no one considered the idea that the force pulling the, the apple down to the ground is exactly the same force as the one that controlled the motion of the heavenly bodies, okay? So Newtonian gravity unifies two quite, what were previously thought to be quite independent phenomena. Well, that's the uh, 17th century. Uh, in the 19th century, the people, people like um, uh, Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell unify two other phenomena, electricity and magnetism into the theory of electromagnetism. So Faraday does the experiments. He's the one messing around with, you know, with coils and, and magnets and, and electric currents. And Maxwell comes up with the mathematics, the equations. Uh, I always remember when I did electromagnetism as an undergraduate, one of the, the things that quite, I, I know, I'm saying it now and it sounds actually quite geeky, I mean, I'll shiver down the spine moment when those of you who are, who are at least second year undergraduates, uh, I suspect will know this, when you start from Maxwell's equations and you run through the algebra and you arrive at the wave equation, a second order differential equation, and there in that equation is the speed of light. Uh, and that M Maxwell realizes this, that electricity and magnetism are part of the same phenomenon, uh, which is a, 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 an electromagnetic wave and light is an electromagnetic wave. So that's what it, it travels through at this, at this constant speed in the universe. This is before Einstein, of course. But that's the, that's the next big step in unification. Okay, jump down to the bottom. Heat and energy and statistical mechanics. So people like Ludwig Boltzmann uh, develop ideas at the end of the 19th century and, and come up with uh, thermodynamics as a, as a very important field in, in physics. If it's so important, look, I'll put it in bold. Okay, then we jump to the 20th, early 20th century. Uh, no, no prizes for the unification of space and time. This is Einstein's special theory of relativity. Again, who'd have thought that space, the, you know, where stuff happens and time going by are part of one and the same four dimensional space time that you can't talk about them separately? Um, we're, 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 we're still you know, still doing sort of undergraduate physics, I guess, at, at this stage. Um, uh, and, and we still are, because I'm sure you, many of you, particularly, I guess, in the final year, you will you'll probably do a course on general relativity. That's when Einstein 
brings together, unifies his special theory with Newtonian gravity. He comes up with a new theory of gravity. He says gravity isn't an invisible force pulling things like an invisible rubber band pulling things together. It's, it is space-time. It is the, the structure, the shape of space-time, and that's what gives you general relativity. Um, and general relativity itself then um, gives birth to modern cosmology, uh, which is the theory describing the, the properties of the universe uh, at large, you know, the shape, the, 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 the age, the, the beginning, the end of, of the universe. All of that is, is really understood by applying general relativity. But general relativity, of course, also tells us about the Big Bang. It tells us about black holes. You will know that... Um, you may not know, but I'm sure you do. You're a physicist. So Roger Penrose, um, Stephen Hawking's uh, long collaborator, won the Nobel Prize for Physics this year, just a few weeks ago, for his work applying general relativity to the study of black holes and, and, and the Big Bang singularity. So general relativity in cosmology, that's the theory of the very large at the largest scales. I'm going to jump back down now to the smaller scale. So this is down here. You see, I'm sure, sure you can see my cursor. So atoms. So again, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, atoms. Um, Ernest Rutherford is the first person to, to look inside an atom or to understand that the inside of an atom uh, is mostly empty space, a tiny nucleus with electrons buzzing around the outside. Uh, and that nucleus is held together by forces. It wasn't quite understood what the, 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 the nature or properties of the nuclear forces were at Rutherford's time, but that's, that, that was the development of nuclear physics, particularly in the 30s that, that uh, helped explain, explain that. Similarly, at the turn of the 20th century, we have quantum theory. I mentioned Max Planck, Albert Einstein, course there are others who then took quantum theory forward and developed what we now call quantum mechanics in the mid-1920s so people like Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, um, Ernest Schrodinger, Wolfgang Pauli, people that you know you will know from your physics degree you will know the surnames because you know about the Schrodinger equation or you know about Pauli's exclusion principle or the Bohr atom or, or uh, uh, um, Dirac notation, you know, so the, the, all these names, these are the of quantum mechanics in, in the 1920s, which then developed to, to describe the, the microscopic world. It then started to be combined with other parts of physics. So the unification, you can, I haven't filled in my slide yet, so you can see unification uh, carries on. By the late 1920s, quantum mechanics and special relativity were unified by uh, Paul Dirac. English physicist, uh, Bristol born and, and bred, in fact. Uh, Paul Dirac, Dirac developed first quantum field theory. Um, likewise, um, ran, you know, ran, ran about the same time, he published a paper very, very soon after his first paper on quantum field theory, in which he unified quantum field theory with electromagnetism to give the, uh, uh, the start of quantum electrodynamics. Now, quantum electrodynamics um, wasn't really fully complete and developed into, until the late 1940s by people like uh, Richard Feynman and others. That becomes a theory, quant a quantum theory of light because it's applying quantum field to electromagnetism. But it's not the only thing that quantum mechanics helps to solve. There are four forces that we know of in nature, okay? We've got gravity, we've got electromagnetism, we've also got the two nuclear forces, okay? The strong and weak nuclear force. Applying quantum mechanics to the nucleus gives us these nuclear forces, and, the, and by the second half of the 20th century, one of them is then, uh, uh, where are we? Oh, yeah, so the strong nuclear force, also has a quantum field theory version that explains it, and that became, became known as chromodynamics, to be compared with quantum electrodynamics. The weak nuclear force, uh, this is the force responsible for, for uh, um, radioactive decay, for example, that was also combined with quantum electrodynamics. So we end up with two of the forces of nature, weak and electromagnetism, within a quantum field theory, which we call the electroweak theory. 
Then the electroweak theory and quantum chromodynamics together, they make what we call the standard model of particle physics. So the standard model isn't a unified theory. It's like an umbrella term that encompasses these two beautiful mathematical constructs, uh, constructs electroweak theory and quantum chromodynamics. But so it was the standard model that people like Peter Higgs were working on uh, that was missing ingredients like the, the Higgs boson. So the standard model of particle physics, I have it in bold, I have thermodynamics in bold, where's the other bold? Well, cosmology, of course, leads to what we call the standard model of cosmology. That lambda CDM start, stands for lambda cold dark matter. Uh, this is the standard model that encompasses everything we know about the universe at the largest scales. Of course, it's missing information. It's missing dark matter. I haven't mentioned dark matter. I've, and of course, it's missing dark energy. Dark matter and dark energy, as you probably know, have nothing to do with each other. Just they have the word dark in front of them and that confuses a lot of people. Uh, they could probably both have had much better names than dark matter. Dark, dark matter should have been called invisible matter. And dark energy, well, make up any call it Gertrude I don't know I mean you know if we don't know what it <laughs> what its origin is you can call it anything really the mysterious force pushing the universe apart anyway you can see I've got dashed lines there because we haven't yet figured out how dark matter and dark energy fit into the standard model of cosmology we've got a good idea we're making good progress but there's still questions that need answering the question the holy grail in fact this is what Stephen Hawking was hoping to, to, to uh, or, or saying that we were close to achieving was this, a theory of everything, a theory of quantum gravity that you, the quantum, which is the standard model of particle physics, with gravity, which is the standard model of cosmology. It's difficult and we haven't done it yet because quantum gravity is trying to bring together two very different types of physical theory. Quantum mechanics and cosmology and, 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 um, and general relativity, really. I mean, that's what standard model of cosmology relies on. The maths is really the general relativity. So when we talk about unifying the standard models in cosmology and particle physics, another way of saying it is I'm trying to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. But, you know, they've, they've, they've evolved in, into much more sophisticated. Um, we haven't got there yet. And it may well be that that's because there are missing ingredients. There are still things we haven't quite understood. For example, a number of physicists, including myself, feel that thermodynamics has a, is going to have a big say in unifying uh, the laws of physics. You know, it's sort of sitting out there by itself. And I'll give you an example of why uh, it might have something to say. But there might be other, you know, we might, uh, we're, people are working on quantum information and trying to build quantum computers. Quantum information theory might feed in in, in some way uh, to, to us understanding, you know, the, a theory of everything. We might have other exotic areas of physics, nonlinear dynamics, complexity theory. You, you know, you're, you're, the, you're called chaos, right? The, um, your, your physics society. So, so chaos theory, does that fit into it? We don't know. Non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And indeed things like something called the black hole information paradox. It links that sort of links um, general relativity with thermodynamics. It's about the nature of entropy and the nature of information. So there's lots of question marks here. There's still lots of things we haven't, you know, we think this might be connected to that, but we're not quite sure. And that's where we're at with unification. This is why Stephen Hawking wasn't quite right when he said we're getting close to a theory of quantum gravity. Now, how are we doing for time? OK, I want to talk for another 10 minutes. So it'll give you time to ask me questions. Um, I want to speed up a bit. Uh, there are candidates for quant for, for theory of everything. Uh, oh, sorry, I think my microphone dropped out for a second. Okay, there are candidates for theory of everything. There's I've depicted here, here as a as an arm wrestle between two superheroes. There's string theory on one side, trying to unify the four forces of nature. On the other side, there's something called loop quantum gravity. Tell us how. Quant how we quantize space and time itself. We start with space and time and quantize it uh, rather than, you know, having space and time and putting, you know, uh, uh, particles in it and, and developing things like um, the graviton, the theory, the, the particle of gravity. We don't know if either of these theories, there are lots of physicists working on each one um, who, who will probably be very staunch advocates for their, their, their approach. 
that they think their approach is probably right and they're not keen on the other side. The problem is we don't have any way of testing these theories yet. We don't, you know, and that's how physics should work. You come up with a theory, you, you test it, you design an experiment, or you go out and make observations to see if your theory's predictions are correct. Uh, and that's how a theory survives. So there are, there are physicists who would argue that things like string theory and loop quantum gravity aren't even scientific theories yet because they're not yet testable. They're very, basically they're very pretty maths. I think that's slightly, I'm not a particular fan of them, but I think it's unfair. I think these are scientific theories in the sense that they should in principle be testable. It's just that we don't know yet how to design an experiment that is going to probe reality at the scale where we can test these ideas. You know, if string theory is right and the universe is, is, is actually nine dimensions of space and one of time and, and, and uh, uh, six of those dimensions of, of space are curled up very small, that size scale is much, much smaller than uh, the elementary particles. So it requires much greater energy than anything that the Large Hadron Collider, collider can produce to probe that, uh, that sort of length scale. So they are scientific theories, but we still haven't yet figured out how we can test them. Maybe we need to go back to basics. So very briefly, we can ask questions like, what is the nature of space? What is the nature of time? Um, if you take an empty box, complete vacuum inside it, nothing. I know, you know, there's, there's never a completely empty vacuum. There's, all, there's always virtual particles popping in and out of existence. But, you know, let's, let's uh, dial dial back a bit and let's say there's an there's empty space inside this box does this space exist in reality is it real or is that space only there because it's defined by the walls of the box if i remove the, the walls does the space still exist so there were um, many thinkers people uh, you know as great as aristotle and, and rene descartes who argued that space doesn't exist unless there's matter in it. You know, the, the space between two objects is just the distance between them. If you take away the objects, the space doesn't exist. But what if you put that box, that empty box, inside a larger box and then remove the walls of the small box? Now, the space that was inside it becomes part of the space of the larger box. So, you know, by adding a larger box, have I made the space inside the smaller box more real? You know, these are deep philosophical questions. Isaac Newton believed that space was real. He believed that space existed. And it was, you know, it had to be in place to put matter and energy into it. That, you know, uh, so space was a real thing. Our current understanding goes back to the work of Einstein. Now, Einstein published a book, a very famous book called Relativity, the Special and General Theory, first published very soon after he finished his general theory and, and submitted his, his papers on that. Published in German, then it got translated into English. It went through various editions, but unlike a lot of books, this book didn't, Einstein didn't edit and change the contents of the book. What he would do instead would, would be add appendices at the end. And the very last appendix, appendix, the famous one, appendix number five, appeared one year before he died. In and in it, he gives one of the most beautiful and profound definitions of what space and time really are. So he says this, if we imagine the gravitational field to be removed, you know, so here we've got space and the field in, in, in space. If you remove the gravitational field, then you're not just left with flat space time. You're left with nothing. Not the way we think or even are taught physics. That, you know, uh, it's because, you know, we're taught physics, you taught special relativity first, that's flat space time, right? Inertial frames, uh, no acceleration, no gravity. And then, and then you bring in matter and gravity and that causes space time to curve. Einstein says, no, space time is the gravitational field. Space time does not claim existence on its own, but only as a structural quality of the gravitational field. In Einstein's general theory of relativity, you've got space and time on one side of the equation, this is his famous field equation, space time on one side, matter and, and mass and energy on the other. You can't have one without the other. So matter and energy define space time, 
get because they they gravi- they produce a gravitational field which which is space time and space time is where matter and energy can exist in so it's very very profound ideas that we're having to rethink in trying to come up with a theory of everything um just to give you an example of why thermodynamics is important i think in this story is just ask yourself which of our the three pillars, I'm going, to, I'm going to define three pillars of, of physics. There's general relativity, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics. So general relativity says time is part of the physical fabric of the universe. It's a dimension, the fourth dimension of space-time that can be stretched and warped by gravity. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, says time is just a number. It's a parameter that you plug the equation into, the, say, the Schrodinger equation, and, you know, if you, if, you, if you know the state of, say, an electron at, at one particular time, T1, you can crank the handle and calculate what the state, the quantum state of that particle will be at any time in the future. You know, you can evolve the wave function to work out what the state will be in the future. Similarly, you can wind it backwards to find out what it was like in the past. There's the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics is fully time reversed provided you don't make a measurement, of course, you know, while you just, you know, when you're not looking. So time in quantum mechanics isn't a dimension, it's a number that you plug into your equation. Thermodynamics says, no, time isn't a dimension, it isn't a number, it's an arrow, an irreversible arrow pointing from the, to the future in the direction of increasing entropy. This is your second law of thermodynamics, okay, that tells you time runs from past to future and not backwards. The directionality of time in thermodynamics doesn't exist in general relativity or quantum mechanics. It only exists in quantum mechanics when we talk about making a measurement. You know, we, we, we study um, the way a quantum system interacts with its environment. It decoheres. Um, choices are made. The wave function collapses is some, sometimes the way people talk about it. So that gives it a directionality. But the actual equations of quantum mechanics themselves don't have a direction to time. <coughs> So if we don't even understand the nature of time and we have different definitions according to our three pillars of physics, then, you know, we realize that our job is far from complete. I want to end with two other fun things, which is sort of basically the uh, um, two other two other things that we don't quite understand. Uh, For example, what came before the Big Bang? Um, It used to be not that long ago that we say, well, look, According to general relativity, there is nothing before the Big Bang because that's the birth of time itself. And the example that I and many other physicists have used to explain it is to say, walk to the South Pole. (coughs) And when you get there, keep heading south. Doesn't make any sense, right? Any once you get to the South Pole, the next step you take in any direction will take you back north again. There is no further south than the South Pole. There is no time earlier than the Big Bang. Well, that is what people thought. Now physicists are even starting to question that. This leads me to my other, my, my final idea, which is this notion of inflation. Now, um, it, it's probably not part of the undergraduate syllabus to talk about inflation theory, but certainly you may have encountered it in popular science books. Um, but it's the idea initially, it was the idea that after the Big Bang, the universe expanded very, very rapidly. This was needed because it helped solve some problems called the flatness problem of the, of, of the universe, right? And, and uh, uh, the idea that, that everything looked the same in, in, in all directions. It, it required the universe to have expanded very quickly in the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So you know, Big Bang, inflation, then the universe st- uh, uh, slowed down to a more steady expansion before, of course, it started speeding up again due to dark energy. Um, But nowadays, cosmologists talk about something called eternal inflation, whereby our universe is not the only one. We have the Big Bang that we talk about is just the Big Bang that created our local universe. But our bubble universe is is a bubble existing in, in a higher dimension, the multiverse, in which inflation is been has been taking place for eternity. Uh, what is inflating? It's not space. It's, it's something called the inflaton field. But every now and again, within that inflaton field, you get a bubble, which is the Big Bang of a universe where 
things slow down and just expand and space and time are formed within that bubble. And so inflation came before the Big Bang, not the Big Bang before inflation. So these are questions we still don't have the answer to. I mean, depending on who you talk to, there'll be some physicists who are absolutely convinced that one or other is right. And they think the other one's a load of nonsense. But, you know, physics is not ideology. Physics is, we don't have a belief or faith in something. This is science. We always have to be um, curious and we have to have doubts and we have to be open to changing our mind in the light of, of, of new information. So lots of things to understand. I'll leave with a, a, a picture, which I love. I, I, I did a ladybird book on, on, on gravity. And these ladybird books, tiny little things with lots of you know, be beautiful illustrations. And, and James, the, um, uh, the, the artist, very kindly produced this, this, the last picture, which is me, godlike, creating uh, universes in, in, in the multiverse. I'm only showing it just because I'm, I'm not very modest. Uh, it doesn't really have anything to add to the story. But I think I'll end there uh, and maybe uh, stop share and give you an opportunity to ask me some questions in the final 12 minutes or so. Yeah, firstly, thank you so, so much. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> thank you so much. That's been My incredible. Pleasure. Yes, please, people. Type oh, questions. yes, questions on the chat, indeed. Right, so yes, people, type, type in questions. Uh, I've got the chat open and I will, I will deal with as many as I can in the time of your, and you know typing questions is is far less daunting than sticking your hand up in a lecture and asking a question and uh, so you shouldn't you shouldn't be shy to, to ask some questions um when i when i've given lectures before people don't ask questions i tell you, i say right i'm locking the doors no one's leaving uh, until until you ask me some decent questions okay good francis has has come up with the first question do you think that it's possible we won't be able to unify physics Absolutely, I think it's possible we won't be able to. That's not the same as saying it, physics isn't unifiable. We just may not have the imagination or the, uh, 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 the skill or the intelligence to know how to do it. But you know, some people say, well, why, you know, why should we be able to unify quantum mechanics and relativity? Maybe look, each to their own uh, and, you know, a bit. But certainly, you know, th th there are examples I can think of, very simple examples, where both quantum mechanics and relativity are needed, right? Think of um, a particle, say an electron, that's in a superposition of being in two locations in space, okay? It has a wave function that has two bumps, so it has a probability of being here or here, and until you look at it, essentially you have to say it's in both places at once, it's in a superposition. Well, that particle, even though it has a tiny mass, it, that mass will still have a gravitational field. So space-time itself in that region will also be in a superposition of, of uh, slightly curved in two locations. And so by definition, space-time has to be explainable quantum mechanically. Okay, so there has to be a unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. But that's not to say that we're going to be clever enough to, to, to find it. Maybe, I actually mentioned this in the book, maybe we're going to need artificial intelligence to come along and, and, and show us how it's done, you know, to, to see through the complexity of the mathematics uh, in, in a way that the, our poor, stupid human brains are not capable of. Okay, right, so, um, question from Phoebe. Is the inflaton field connected to Penrose's idea of cyclic cosmology? where heat death of one universe becomes the scales below. Um, no, so, so Penrose's idea is that the universe, you know, our Big Bang was the big crunch of an earlier generation universe. And so it, it, it cycles, universe expand, recollapse, expand, recollapse. Uh, certainly I think that's, that's my understanding of Penrose's idea. And his, his uh, uh, a test or you know he, what, what he proposes is that we should be able to see the signature of the previous universe imprinted in the cosmic microwave background uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a subtle detail that, I, that I'm, I'm not so familiar with so I won't talk about something I don't understand but no his I, I think uh, I, I would say that Roger Penrose is not 
someone who is is a, a fan of of the inflate on field and 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 uh, eternal inflation idea. Uh, Shreya asks, "What do you mean by inflation in a higher dimension?" Um, well, simply that it's always easier when we talk about higher dimensions to drop a dimension, uh, and then you 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 have another dimension in hand. So it, imagine the the universe is just three dimensions of space. Uh, and our universe has two dimensions of space. Forget time. Our universe has two dimensions. So our universe could be the surface of a sphere. Well, a, a, a sphere is a, is a surface. It's, a sphere is a, is, a, is a curved, enclosed, two-dimensional shape. So if our universe is, 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 is like a, a, a sphere, so it's curved two dimensions, it can exist embedded within three-dimensional space. And that, that, that those two dimensions can expand, they can get bigger and bigger because they're expanding into three dimensions. Now, when we talk about the expansion of space, we don't, we don't really need a higher dimension for it to expand into. Because that's you know, one of the questions I always get asked, what does space, when it expands, what does it expand into? Well, it doesn't expand into anything. It is the whole of space. But in this multiverse idea, it, it would be expanding into a, a higher dimensional uh, um, volume for, for want of a better word uh, uh, th th that is the the, the multiverse um how do you recommend getting into science communication uh if an area anyone here is interested in um lots of people are obviously keen on getting into science communication i was chatting to to uh, a couple of the guys orlando and francis and eden before we started um saying that when i got into science communication it wasn't really a thing or certainly it wasn't a respectable thing to do. Now that's changed. So it was never my ambition to begin with. My advice now is that there are lots and lots of opportunities in science communication. Don't immediately say, right, I wanna be a Jamal Khalili or even more famous, be a Brian Cox and be presenting TV documentaries, right? You know, you don't, you don't jump from, you know, there are only so many Brian Coxes around, thank goodness. Um, but you know, that, that, that is, just one aspect of science communication. My, my advice is always decide whether you want to be a science communicator, which is a perfectly valid career choice to do. You know, you could be a science journalist, you could be a science writer, you could be working in science policy, you could be uh, um, uh, a, a broadcaster, working in a press office, you know, anything where you're getting science across to wider society. That's a good career or you could do what I do, which is not a science communicator, but a scientist who communicates. You know, I still have a day job. I still teach undergraduates. I still have a research program. And I do the communicating as, a, as a, another arm of my activity. But that absolutely, I would recommend it. I would recommend anyone who wants to, to at least do a bit of science communicating, because that helps you understand the subject yourself. But be careful, don't jump in head first and ignore, you know, the, the, the opportunity to to, to fully qualify as a scientist yourself. Uh, right, oh goodness me, lots of questions coming in. So I've got five minutes, I'm gonna try and get through them quickly. Star Wars or Star Trek? In Star Trek, I'm afraid, I'm so old. I, I used to watch the, the early, the original Star Trek in the late 60s, early 70s. And you know, that came before Star Wars. Do I have a favorite physicist? <sighs> I, I changed my mind. You know, it was Richard Feynman, and then I realized he was a bit of a misogynist. <laughs> he shouldn't be my favorite. It was Bohr, maybe, because, you know, he was just so brilliant. But then do I, am I keen on the Copenhagen interpretation? Einstein? Okay, Feynman, Bohr, and Einstein. There you go, those three. Um, would I say that a theory of everything will be true, would truly be the end of physics? Would it just be another Lord Kelvin moment? Um, <laughs> well, I think... A theory of everything would draw a line in one chapter of physics, trying to find a fundamental unified picture of all the forces of nature. It won't be the end of physics. We're still, there's still lots of other stuff and details that we're, we're working out. But actually, it may well be that in, in reaching what we think is a theory of everything, we realize there's still more to be understood. It's just another layer of the onion that we're peeling back uh, and we find other mysteries and other things we need to... to and that's what I would prefer. I'd prefer for it not to come to an end. You know, 
guess a, a lot of you might, must feel the same that the joy of physics isn't having all the answers it's the search for those answers it's finding out if we knew everything meh, it's a bit like you know the anticipation of opening your christmas presents um and then once you've opened them and you've got them okay well great I, you know I, i've got my presents but the that the excitement uh are there any observations that suggest the existence of the multiverse or, or, or string theory? Uh, is it solely theoretical maths? At the moment, it's still theoretical. At the moment, it's still mathematics. Um, it's very powerful maths. It's having, uh, 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 it's finding uses uh, in other areas of physics, for example, in condensed physics. Um, but no, we don't yet have a, a, any empirical observations that can tell us whether string theory is uh, right or wrong. And that's, that, that means that a, a lot of physicists who don't work in that field, I think are getting frustrated. Oh, you know, we're all, the greatest minds are devoted to trying to figure out string theory. You know, come on guys, you're not going anywhere. We do, do something useful. I still think string theory is useful, but we haven't got there yet. Would it be impossible to, uh, to advance AI past a certain point? like a Jupiter brain. I'm not quite sure I know what a Jupiter brain is. Maybe I should. Or would it take too much energy to run? Uh, does, it, does anyone quickly want to tell me what a Jupiter brain is in the last few minutes we got? Someone unmute yourself and give me a one sentence definition. Go on. Go on, be brave. Uh, uh, it's a planet-sized it, it, AI machine. Say that again, sorry? A planet-sized AI machine. A planet-sized AI machine. Poof. Well, uh, that would certainly require more energy than, yeah, than probably we, we would be able to, to, to cope with uh, or, or, or to, to harness. Uh, but I don't think we would need anything like that. You know, I think we, we will eventually reach a point, it was the so-called singularity, when AIs are more intelligent than us, and then we can leave AIs to develop more, more sophisticated AIs. Whether or not they, they then think the human race is superfluous and get rid of us is, a, is another issue. A lot of people are a bit concerned about that. But I think we, we will have much more interesting um, challenges long before we get to a Jupiter-sized brain. Um, I think maybe time for one more question. I, the, the interesting one. You choose um, it. Do you think that some physics is becoming closer to philosophy as more unprovable theories appear? I, I, I think, no, I don't think so. I think um, a lot of physics is getting so mathematical that we, we, we don't yet know how to test it. I think, in fact, the opposite. I think we should have more philosophical input into physics. The founders of relativity and quantum mechanics, the Bohr's, the Einstein's and the Dirac's and others were steeped in philosophy. They really understood the philosophy of science. These days, far too many physicists mistakenly in my view, will argue that philosophy is dead. That, you know, that, uh, you know, physics is making all the advances, philosophy is, 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 is just navel gazing. I think we would benefit a lot and we may well find that's the best avenue for progress if we talked more with philosophers. Throughout science, it's always been that philosophers ask the questions and scientists try to answer them. Sometimes we get, or I feel we're getting to the point where we're not asking the right questions and that's where we need the help of philosophy. So on the contrary, I think we should get a bit more philosophical. Like, and, and, and quantum mechanics is a good example. The, found, the foundation of quantum mechanics, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, you know, quantum mechanics is the most powerful mathematical theory probably in the whole of science, and yet we don't know what it means. We have all these different, is it many worlds? Is it pilot waves, Copenhagen interpretation? And all, there's half a dozen or more different ways of explaining it. We need philosophers to help us because we need to know how nature behaves. It's not good enough just to say, oh, well, it, the maths works, shut up and calculate. It just, you know, it depends on the day of the week whether you believe there are parallel universes or not. There are either there are, either are or there aren't parallel universes. Uh, and, and, and we need to understand, you know, philosophy to help us answer questions like that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a mouthful. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you for taking us for a paddle on the shore of physics. It was amazing. And it was like, a nice day, wasn't it? And you all had your sun cream on and it was all very pleasant. 
and 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 apologies for not um, getting through all the questions. Oh no, no, don't worry. Oh, and everyone's giving you a little round of applause when you see. Ah, excellent. You can see. Oh, yeah. yes, I can. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, that's that's the way we do things now, isn't it? <laughs> well, no, it's been it's been a pleasure. I, I've enjoyed chatting to you. Well, thank you and everyone else, thank you for coming and I hope you continue to have an amazing evening after such an amazing talk. So yes, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Bye everyone. Okay.